Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Above the Bar podcast. For each week, we belly up to the bar with a new guest, find out what they do, who they are, and what makes them great. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Alrighty, folks, welcome back to the Above the Bar podcast. We have bellied up on this. I've gone from weather that was 80 degrees in North Carolina to now I'm back up in New York, and it's like 40 some and was snow in, and now it's goofy weather. But if you're going to have goofy weather, you got to stay in a good positive mood. And who better to have somebody who is positive and somebody who can help you get to a positive place and I forgot to tell her beforehand that I have no plans for how I introduce people. I just come up with it off the cuff. So I figured, you know what, as she's sitting here across from me in what looks to be a beautiful red dress and smiling and happy. So joining us, and she'll have to tell us where she's joining us from parts unknown. We got Miss Chrissa Z. Hi, how are you? You know, it's funny. I was actually just in California um, less than 24 hours ago in sunny, warm weather and back in New York right. City in freezing cold weather. So I, right. I feel pain. New York City, before we get too far, yeah. favorite, ramen, favorite ramen spot. Oh, my Lord. There is a spot near me that I order from all the time called the Noodle Bar. That's pretty fabulous. That's a very famous spot, the Noodle Bar. Very good. It's very, I, very I, good. Yes. I'll yes. give you that. Mine, I actually couldn't even tell you the name of it. Do you know K-Town at all? A little bit, yes. Mm -hmm. So if you were headed up to K-Town, coming with like Penn Station at your back, so coming up to it, Uh at the very end of K-Town on the right-hand side, there's a little spot, the best broth and the best eggs. Yes. Those are the two things for me that make like super good uh, ramen. And I love the city. Like my wife tries to get ramen up here in all, I'm in Albany. Ah, gotcha. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it's not just the same. It's I know. just not. I know. But I know. the raw, the broth is fantastic. The other side, like it's just yeah. There's gorgeous. something to it. That, you know, you got to have good broth. But that that all being said, what we got all you got all kinds of folks popping up here, Miss Chris. Oh, all right. You, well, got, you got press and media just popped up. You have Maureen underneath here. I got almost as many people watching us on, from behind the stage as I did uh, on a live stream. Oh, look at that. The, Look at that. So real quick, folks, as we before we get too far in this, let's go ahead and take care of some house cleaning. As always, over my right shoulder, that's the big board for sticker and a cause. Maybe you've got something you're supporting. You've got a band. You've got a club. You've got an organization. Whatever it is that you're supporting and you want other people to know about it, you can catch me on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, X, Instagram, TikTok, for as long as that's going to last. Uh, all those different places, even our email is the above the bar podcast at gmail.com. Reach out to me. Let me know what you got going on. I'll tell you where to, where to send the stickers to. We'll let everybody know what's happening and we'll do our best to, to get that information out to everyone. So they know about you. Now we also got to talk about our sponsor. Sponsorship is important. That's why we're here. And you know what? You might even know about our sponsors, Chris. Have you ever heard of budget blinds? No, I have not. Well, Budget Blinds has been around for over 30 years, and they are the largest window treatment company in America, and they have locations in Canada, so they're international, Mm -hmm. and they are a true custom window treatment company. This is not big box stuff. This is not going to Walmart or Home Depot or Lowe's where they're they're just going to cut it down for you. They're going to come out to your home. They're going to measure for you. They're going to let you know what it is. They have their own installers. They're going to tell you what the cost is. And on top of that, the biggest thing, folks, that people don't realize about budget blinds, comparably, we've all broken a win- a blind before. I don't know about you, Chris. I've broken so many broke- times. It's very annoying. Yeah, so many and, times. And the worst part about it is, is when you break it, you bought it. That's it. It's over. Well, with budget blinds, all their window treatments come with at least a five-year, no questions asked warranty on top of a limited lifetime warranty that are mechanical. What that means for you is if something breaks, you reach out to them, you let them know what happened, and they're going to go ahead and take care of you and get you a brand new window treatment. That's Budget Blinds of East Greenbush and Budget Blinds of Hudson and Kosaki, New York. Told you I'm upstate. 
East Bay Horse Watson, Kusaki. I mean, we're all up here. Like so make it. sure you let them know you're there to belly up to the bar, and they're going to give you a 15% discount off your entire order. 15% right. is nothing to, you know, sniff at. It's pretty good for blinds. They're very expensive. Yeah, you know, especially custom stuff. When you get into that that custom game, it, it's a different animal. So, right. all right, Miss Grissom. So we're all, we're done. We're done. Okay. You're, you're looking. I'm going to, I mean this in the most respectful of man manners. You look very beautiful this evening. Thank you, you very much. You, I, I appreciate you because I'm just wearing a long sleeve shirt like I'm sitting at the bar because I'm sitting <laughs> at my bar and you look like you're you're sitting at a very elegant like hotel lounge nice I bar at my bar <laughs> like you you're look like you're you're ready to go and and I look like a schlub so oh, not at all. Not it, all. it is what it is but so I want to kind of get into this and make sure I got everything correct so sure. and if you look we didn't get to talk about this either if you see me looking to my left say hi to Instagram real quick all my Instagram oh, fans yeah. over there hi, they're over there Hello. so they're they're on my left hand side Instagram. Okay. So that's just kind of how, how this all works out for me. But so you started off, if I, if I understood everything right, that I was reading, you were, I mean, you weren't just in fashion, you were doing pretty doggone good for yourself. Do, you know, do I understand that right? I was, I was doing pretty good. Yeah. But I was like, in fashion like, for a long time. I was in apparel for almost 11 years. So I'd, I'd been in that industry for a while. I started off at the bottom, if you will. I really always wanted to do visual merchandising. And then I worked my way up. And I attribute that to like a lot of actual like luck being in the right place at the right time. Um, but also creating opportunities for myself and being uh, courageous and risky uh, to make things happen. So you were, I mean, you were established in that industry. Mm -hmm. So, so 11 years established in that industry, you're, you're going along here. I'm, I'm reading some, some of the notes here about you. Uh, let's see, reaching the pin, as we said, you reached the pinnacle before you were in your thirties. I mean, you were there. Yeah, I did. I got really high up pretty quickly, if you will. Um, that did mean I sacrificed a whole personal life, but I did have a good career. I don't recommend that, but it did work in my favor. Um, and, yeah. and then you walked away from it. I did. It was a little bit, uh, probably like my early thirties when I walked away. Um, so I've had a couple of uh, very successful women on my show that have been in the same boat. And before we get into what you're doing now, it's always a very interesting thing for me to talk to women who have done this mm. as a man. If I was at that pinnacle and I said, Hey Jim, I'm leaving this and I'm going to go start a career as an underwater basket weaver, other, <laughs> other men would be like, you know what, Sean, you can do it. Yeah. But from the women I've spoken to who have been in similar situations, you guys turn around and you're like, you reach out to another woman and you're like, Hey, I've decided that I'm going to go ahead and walk away from this mm -hmm. and I'm going to make this other career path. And you're chastised for it. A little bit. I think that's what that it's like. Well, I, I want to respond to that. I think sometimes yeah. it comes from when you when you have a lot of success and you kind of figure out your own roadmap. Um, now it's probably less something. It's not as um, we're not as present to it. But you know, ten years ago or now this has been longer. It's been almost fifteen years ago. I'm being able to get access that type of success and that type of clout inside of an organization wasn't always readily available. So it was something that people had a lot of like scarcity mindset around. If I put it into that kind of category. Right. Um, and so people don't want you to mess up or lose out on something good, um, which is just a very human response to you know trying something new and going into the unknown. Fear really just means on the other that you care about something on the other side. Right. So that's really where that comes from. Um, and I also, you know, when I was deciding whether or not I was going to stay in the industry I was in or or uh, change industries. Um, all of my all of my friends had a little bit of a meltdown, um, but most importantly, they were more concerned about the free samples that they got because they were <laughs> company. They were like, "But wait a minute, we get free clothes and free shoes. What's going to happen?" I'm like, "You don't get that stuff anymore." So right. they, were, they were more concerned about their wardrobes than they were about my career path. Wow, that <laughs> that's rough. So, so what made so? You, you take this step away from it and you realize that for you, there was this passion for coaching, but not just, you know, 
we're talking executive coaching, which is a, to me is a, an entirely different animal. And in coaching is, is I want to kind of get into that element of it in and of itself before we get too far into what type of coaching you're doing, because I feel like this is something that we, for a long time, we said, Hey, well, everybody needs a mentor. You should have a mentor, go find a mentor. Mm -hmm. And that was typically somebody within your, your organization, where you work, worked at, and they kind of mentored you in your field. Mm -hmm. That's right. I guess now I, I guess probably first heard the coaching thing, maybe 10 years ago is for me mm -hmm. is when I first started hearing it. And then all of a sudden we heard this coaching, you need a coach, you need a life coach. Cause it, yeah, it was actually where I heard it first was NBA players and mm -hmm. NFL players, eight, you know, 21, 22 years old with millions of dollars. And they're like, you guys are blowing through this money. You got to have a coach. You need a coach. Yes. yes. That's and, right. and that was the first place I heard it. And it was like, oh, crap, like this is this is important. Mm -hmm. But there's that was just coaches. Now there's you can get a life coach. You can get an executive coach. You can get a business coach. You can get a coach for anything. Mm -hmm. What drew you initially to this entire field? Yes. OK, so it's a little bit of a long story. Am I at liberty to tell it? Time. Okay, perfect. Well, um, so when I was at, growing up in my field and when I worked in marketing and branding in the apparel space, I uh, was struggling in my leadership. And, you know, what's true about people in their careers is when they're good at what at their job, people think that they can lead other people. It's like we just make this assumption. It's not the same qualities and or skills. Um, so, you know, I didn't have the qualities and skills to lead people. I, I was good at managing process and tasks, but leading was a, was a whole other animal and I was struggling. So through a various chain of events, I hired a coach. Um, at the time I was really resistant to the process of hiring a coach. I wanted no part of it. One of my colleagues had a coach and she suggested it would be helpful. And I was like, who does that? It's ridiculous. No, thank you. Like, who's going to tell me what to do? They don't right. understand me. I had all the list. I was a horrible client, by the way, as well. But I so I hired this coach. And um, the first coach I hired, I actually really did hate and then fired them. I <laughs> was an awful client. Um, but what that first engagement did is it opened me up to this idea of personal development and taking that by the reins really for myself and understanding it was an avenue to getting to where I really wanted to go, which was higher in my field. Um, so I hired, I hired a new coach this time I actually gave them a chance and didn't hate them from the jump. Um, shockingly, they were more successful with me <laughs> than the other coach, you know? Um, and so we worked together for about two years. And in that time I, realized that not only did I love doing what I was doing and I had this creative slash business side to me, but I also really liked understanding what made people tick. And so I decided that I would train to be a coach because I thought it'd be helpful in my career because at that time I was dealing with a lot of politics and corporate bureaucracy and really didn't know how to navigate the various scenarios. Um, and I was young and I was working with a lot of men and I was leading a lot of men and that was had its own set of challenges, especially almost 15 years ago, very different landscape than what we're in today. Uh, and so I jumped into coach training as a way to round myself out as an executive, fell in love with coaching people. Um, one of my first um, clients that I had was someone that was going to school to be a um, neurosurgeon. Her whole family um, were doctors and surgeons, and she did not want to do this. She wanted to be a writer. And one, my job with her was to help her go tell her parents what she really wanted to do and help her change majors. And it was a very rewarding process. She told her parents she changed majors. You know, she was the first person to sort of divert from being in the medical field. And um, she sort of paved the way for others in her family to go do something a little different. And so I was quite astounded by that process and realized, oh, this is kind of cool to do. And because I had been so committed to my corporate life and I was growing in a certain direction, I was like, okay, this can be like pro bono work. I'll coach on the side. It's like my volunteering time. I'll make a little bit of money, but <laughs> it's, my, it's my volunteering time. And I did that for six years, actually. 
Um, and in that time, I, I did everything from traditional life coaching to couples coaching to business coaching, to executive coaching, like I kind of ran the gamut, the various types of clients that I worked with. And at some point, I was at this intersection in my career where the company I was working for was getting bought and sold repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And it was just a tumultuous time. And it was it was time for me to leave. But I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I was less clear about did I want to stay in this field? And I decided that um, I was just going to leave and uh, figure it out from there. And in that process, the company I had been moonlighting for reached out to me, my part time coaching side hustle, as I like to call it, reached out to me. And they were like, you know, we need to build out our corporate department. Do you want to come on board and help us figure out how we do that? And so I did. And that's how it all happened. So, so we're not even like, I'm going to kind of roll back for a second. Mm -hmm. So six years of doing this kind of on the side, you know, you were, I mean, you were really, I mean, to me, when I'm hearing this, I guess what the first thing that comes to mind is it was a bigger leap than I think people even realize for you to walk away. Cause you really were still tethered to your, your quote unquote career. Yes. Before you made that move. So when you, when you, was there, maybe I missed it. Was there a particular moment where you were like, okay, I, I got to cut this loose. And what was that like? So it wasn't necessarily this like, like crescendo of a moment. Let me put it that oh. way. <laughs> um, but I remember this day really vividly. I was walking from the subway to my office in 7th Avenue and I was wearing, you know, like a fashion like outfit and had a, like $11 latte in my hand and I'm walking to like, <laughs> the corner office and I like am very annoyed. I'm annoyed, I'm irritable and there's nothing wrong. Like everything in my life is great. Work is really good. Things are moving in the right direction, but my affect was off. Uh. And so uh, what I realized is that you know, and this is why I teach my clients now. And if we start talking about career transition, this is one of the places where I start, which is like when we are done with a dream, when we feel like we've gotten to the other side of something, we become a little bit bored, a little bit irritable, a little bit annoyed. And that's not that's not a bad sign. That's not something is wrong. It means that we need to figure out what's next, right? We're starting to lack a little inspiration. And I couldn't quite put that together. For like a few weeks of time, actually, until that day when I was walking with my latte and I was like, oh, I think I'm over this. Like, I think it's time to do something else. And I didn't know what that other thing was because my dream was to, you know, really be like the highest level I could be in my career. And yeah. when we have a great career or good things going and it's all working and it's all the things that we might want it to be, whether we care about prestige or money or just personal satisfaction, it's very hard to admit that we've come to the end of that dream. So that that's the piece that was the biggest struggle for me is, is being able to admit that. So then when you're working with people, how does, again, I love devil's advocate for a minute. Have you ever told someone, no, you probably shouldn't change their career? Yes, actually, I always start with don't make a move. Um, the thing that will happen, so when humans are up against stress and conflict, they respond by either deciding to like run away, shut down, or fight for it. Um, most people, by the time they get to me or the time, by the time they get help, they've already tried to fight it. It's like going to a couple's therapist. You've already tried to figure it out on your own. You fought, and now you're like, I just want to be out. Um, that's because you didn't have all the right tools to figure out how to navigate something. So I never advocate for like leave right away. I always advocate for let's figure out how to make this the best place you can be and give you all the tools to do that. And then let's see what happens. And sometimes that pressure of putting on like, let's be great at this unveils that actually you're done with it. And it come, that comes out in a very specific way. And other times it unveils that like this works, but you're just not cast in the right position or not necessarily in the right company. So maybe that's the move we have to make. It's not blowing up all of the pieces. Got it. And, and real quick, folks, if you're just jumping in, we've got Krissa Z Boyce. And if you want to look up what she's got going on, it's ChrissaZBoyce.com. And that's Chris A Z. And then Boyce is B O Y C E.com. Check out what she's got going. And you can find her on LinkedIn at, and Instagram. It's all the same. It's Chris Z Boyce. 
look her up, see what she's got going on. And if you're out there watching, if you're finding us through Chris or Chris or through us, make sure you're giving those likes, those follows. It might sound cliche, but it's important. This is how messages get out. This is how people get found. And if you're out there and you're maybe you're thinking about making a career transition change or you've got some questions, go ahead and drop those questions in so we can see what, what everybody else is thinking about. Now, I'm going to ask some more questions on my own here, though. So what is – so coaching, again, we, we've talked about that there's a lot of different elements to it. But when people first come to you, is there an assessment process or, you know, it, what is – what is your process to help them to start getting it? Or, or even that you could tell somebody right now, probably even a better question. What is something you could tell somebody even before they go to a coach, do this or this before you go even talk to a coach? Cause you may not even need this yet. Uh, great question. So I'll answer the first, the first question, which is for me, there is no assessment that I do. And I actually am very um, con- committed to that. The reason for that is because there are so many types of coaches that you can go to and each coach has a model, if you will, or structure for how they like to coach people. Um, And many coaches have a a true like actual process they follow because they're using a specific paradigm. I don't subscribe to any of that. I I really look at myself as more of a strategist um, and I am trained and versed in a bunch of different modalities and models. But I like to be able to have them all at my disposal because I don't believe that it's a one size fits all for a client. And the value of coming to a coach from where I sit is that they're not telling you what you could read in the book. If you can go read a book about a model that you can follow, anybody can follow steps, right? Like, so there's a great system called EOS, right? The Entrepreneur's Organization System. I'm sure most of your people probably know about this. It's a great model for how to like build a business operationally. You can read that book and you can apply that process. Like you don't need to hire someone to tell you to do that. What you need a coach for is to help you figure out which tools to pull from, when and how to use them, and then to reflect back to you what you're doing or not doing that is producing the results or not producing the results that you want. So I like to put it all on the table, have all the options, and then figure out what's going to work best for the client and respond from there. Now, because I'm a strategist, that means that at some point I might have to say we have to hire a specialist. Like you need to go bring in a very specific business coach up for this topic, or we might need to bring in like a couples therapist or, or whatever, whatever the need might be. But for the most part, I can cover cover a lot of ground because I operate from the place of all these tools are valuable. And my job is to figure out which one to teach you and when. Interesting. So that's a lot. Yes. <laughs> that's that's a lot. So okay, I got a pro- <laughs> I got a process because really I I've never heard of a coach that doesn't do some kind of assessment. What what drove that? I'm really curious about that right now. So that's got me very interesting because that's a that's a very unique approach. What drove you to um to not use a coach or not to, excuse me, not use an assessment? What mm-hmm. drove that? For you to, because I think that's a very unique style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I've used this, I've used assessments or models in the past. And in fact, the you know the company I worked for prior to having my own consultancy had a very specific model that we used that was quite useful. In fact, okay. the tools are great. Um, and and there are many models that are very that are very good. Some of them are actually can be very similar. Um, if you break them down, maybe we just use different acronyms or processes. So I got to pause you for one second. I'm sorry. Do you know who Robbie T is that keeps Robbie. popping up? I do did not you, know who T is. No. I, I think you guys, when you guys shared the link, did you share the StreamYard link? I am not sure. I do not know. Robbie, I'm going to kick you off again. This is, you're on the backside. You got to go find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or something like that. It's all the Above the Bar podcast. Nothing personal, but I think you might have got sent the wrong link. Thanks, bud. I appreciate you. We have people wanting to join the, the green room. They, they just wanted to talk to you. They were just coming in through the back door. <laughs> they were coming in. They were ready to go. I didn't mean to, to pause you there. So so back to my question, which was what, what drove that uniqueness mm-hmm. of I'm not going to have like a paper assessment or go through, you know, one of those personality assessments. What drove that? Because I think that's so unique. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. Um, so again, that doesn't mean I don't use those tools. I don't bring right. them in. It just, it just, I don't, I'm it's not, not an initial tool for you. It's not a starting point. And it's not a rigid format. What, what drove that is that you, I believe you have to meet a client where they're at. So for, for some clients, they'll come in and they're ready to goal set. Like they know, they, okay, I have to do this. I want to get this done. We got to start with goal setting. Some clients come in and it's like, it's a disaster show, whatever they're dealing with. And we have to deal with like, triage that looks very different than goal setting um other clients might come in and they are in a place where they're dealing with a lot of feelings or emotions about something and and it, they require just being there for them and listening to them and just holding space until they get to the other side while nudging them so it's unfair to go put somebody in a program and then expect that you're going to get the right result you have to meet people where they're at and we also have to be receptive and responsive to a situation. Otherwise, you're just making it about your own agenda and covering all the points you want to cover, but not necessarily delivering what the client needs. It's almost like I like to I say it this way. When you go to like a traditional doctor, right? They do all the tests and they're like, okay, goodbye, you're fine. But if you go to a holistic doctor, right? They ask you different questions and they're like, oh, wait a minute, your hair is falling out. Well, let's talk about what kind of food you're eating. Meanwhile, if you went to a regular doctor, you'd go to a dermatologist and they say your hair follicles are fine, you're good, goodbye, right? Like that would be putting somebody into a model. And that's why I think it, I like, I think I like- You to tailor it to the person. You you really tailor it to to that yes. individual. Yes. So so you're going through, through this coaching process. Where did, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you deal very heavily in that executive space yes. now. Mm-hmm. What made you kind of, gravitate more to that vice you said she did some re- relationship coaching and, and some other stuff what drove you to say you know what i'm staying in this other space mm, yeah i i like the executive coaching space because it gives me the best of both worlds the first part is that you can't help a client be a better executive or leader without actually touching their personal life right because those tangential areas and influence how you show up at work if you're sleeping if you're eating if your you know romantic relationships are intact it's going to impact you at work so there's a benefit to you get to go play in those other places yet the focus is helping somebody really be proud and happy in their career and because of my business background i get to also help people really shape their companies and i mean that's something i love to geek out on so if you really want to talk about things that are yeah. fun and- a process and operations and I, having a good day. I, I, look, if, if you if it's your, if it's your bag, because because that's my next thing is, you know, you're you're meeting them on this level. I know I asked the question, have you ever told someone not to make a, a career change? Because I think that and I know I'm focusing on the career piece and, and folks, that that's something that's interesting to me, because I think in today's society, I heard this recently. And as a coach, I'd love to get your vibe on this. We we come from, you know, you're you I if you're not way younger than me, I want to know whatever you're eating or or what you're because I think you're way younger than me. I'm 47 and I think you're like you said something about 15 years in that industry, like you said 15 years, and I'm trying to do the math and the 30, and that don't work out in my head. The math isn't working. But um I think you know, we come from that everybody changes jobs every five years. That was like for the longest time. Mm -hmm. And then I recently heard something that was, oh, you should be changing jobs every two years because you're leaving money on the table. You got to change every two years. And as somebody who did staffing for years, I would tell you, you're not going to get a job because after the second time that I saw two years on your resume, I'm going to turn around and tell you, you're not employable. Mm -hmm. Stay away. Mm -hmm. As a coach, are you running into that? Do you have to coach people? How How is that affecting your world? It's generational. What do you mean? So what I mean by that is um, people who are younger, let's put them in like the 20 to like 30 bucket, they okay. change pretty quickly. And it's rather acceptable in today's day and age for people to move rather quickly around. Um, okay. People who are probably in their like 30s to 40s, they're they're in the mix of like I stay somewhere for a few years and then I figure it out. Um, there is a there is a very uh, strong mentality about up or out. So most people will hang around for a couple of years and if they feel like they're not going to grow, then they're probably looking to change in their third year, um, in that thirty to forty um, bucket. And then forty to like let's just call it 
mid 60s, that's actually when um, people should be leaving. <laughs> they should be changing their careers and they, they're not careers. They should be changing like their jobs uh, right. because that's when they're going to get the most advancement, actually. And they're probably going to put themselves in a position where they're able to use their skill set in a different way. Um, if they're tip, if they've been in a company for a long time in their, their like, you know, late 40s, early 50s, they're likely still going to be in a specific role. Um, and at that age, what we all sort of want to start to do is we want to start to move from like the doer executor role to like the leader consultant teacher role. And it's hard to do that inside of a company when there isn't any upward mobility, not to anything fault of your own, but more because there's somebody else in that role and you're not right. going to, to move. So that's it's not I, good to push them down steps. You should not push that person down steps. Yeah, exactly. You can move up. I mean, yeah. Exactly. So that's when I advise, exactly. That's when I advise people to go, okay, it's time to switch now. And that's when people are most resistant to leave because they have good credibility and they um, have been somewhere for a while. They're established. They yeah, they're established. Mm -hmm. So, so you, so, and that kind of get, gets into my next question. So you do advise people also in that career change also. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you ever ran, I don't know. I, we're going to get nosy for a minute. Oh, please. Let's do Have it. Have you ever had somebody who's like, so I understand I'm I'm the CFO of this major company, but I want to play the banjo. <laughs> I'm just going to play the banjo for the rest. Like anything that you've dealt with where you're like, listen, that sounds cute and a lot of fun and would work out for about six months, but that's not a good idea. Like, have you ever run into like any crazy, like just, and I don't want to use the term crazy, anything that was so like, out of left field, somebody wanting to do a career change where you're like, pause, folks, come back to reality for me. Um, my answer to that is no. Uh, and and yes, and, and the point of saying that is I guess that people will want to go do an outlandish like left or right turn. And typically it makes sense as to why they want to do that. And they've probably, they've probably been sitting on it for a while. Um, and usually what I advise is that we figure out a way to either get there, like let's create a, you know, a two year or three year plan from, from a financial perspective or like a, you know, career trajectory perspective, or I suggest something like looking into doing fractional work or consulting. Um, something a little lighter, a little lighter, lighter work. Yes. Right. Where you can go add value. Um, you can offer your expertise. You're still a high level executive inside of an organization. This is what I like doing fractional work. I like to go in to support people and like operations and process and systems that allows me to do many things that make me happy without being connected or tethered to one organization. So I, I advise that quite often, especially when people are sort of like in their mid 40s, early 50s and they are established, but they feel like, you know what, this is no longer feeding me. I, I just think that's that's wild to me. Like, I, I think I wouldn't have expected you to say that in that over 40 range, that's when people should be making those moves. They think in our heads, we think when you're younger, you can make all the mistakes and you can move companies and you can you can kind of bounce around. But once you get older, you should be all right. You need to stick your foot somewhere and kind of hold on you want to make sure you're maximizing any investments and all that. Uh, so I'm just, I'm fascinated by this entire topic because the coaching thing to me is, is huge. I, I, I read a lot of books on it. Was there anyone in that, in this space for you? Like I'm a big Brandon Richard fan. Mm -hmm. I, li I like him. Mm -hmm. I, I listen to growth, growth day in the mornings. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it helps me out. But is who were some of the influences for you that you take into your process? That's a good question. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind is I remember when I was like maybe 18 or 19 and I was in Barnes and Noble and at like on this bottom shelf in like the corner, there was a book about coaching and I somehow found it and read it. And I do not remember who wrote this book, but I remember reading it, being really intrigued by it at this point, having no idea about what, what I was going to do in my life. And whoever wrote that book was super influential, and I actually still have it somewhere. Um, so I, I can't like, give credit to anybody, but that book wildly shaped my perspective because at that time I was figuring out what classes to take in school and college. And, you know, I was leaning towards psychology classes and anthropology classes and sociology, and but like none of them really fit. Like I knew I didn't want to be a researcher, but I knew I did, but I also didn't, knew I didn't want to be a doctor. But like, where did I kind of fall into like the space 
of professional development and helping people. I, I wasn't super clear about that. And I also knew that I wanted to do something in the creative field and had this whole love of fashion and couldn't quite figure out how to marry all the things together. So that said, that book wildly changed my perspective on things and always stuck with me. Um, and then I really am a fan of Brene Brown for her vulnerability work, because as we know, from a leadership standpoint, learning how to be vulnerable and um, being able to show humility are, are very important qualities that we don't typically talk about in traditional leadership training. We talk about like decision making and innovating and um, all these sort of uh, more like hard, like aggressive sort of skills. But the reality is in building relationships and getting buy-in and coalescing, you have to be able to learn how to be vulnerable and, and, and humble to have um, good teams underneath you and like loyal followers. So I like her work because I think she lays it out in a very smart way and it's approachable. I think that's a huge part of coaching. Coaching has to be approachable mm -hmm. because you've already said it. Your first, your first coach, somebody said you need this. And you, you, even if that person was approachable, you were like, you weren't approachable. <laughs> yes, I was not approachable. You weren't approachable in the second time around. It was, but but it, it's a it's a two way street. Now you said something, and I gotta ask this. This is completely out of left field. In your coaching process, since you were in fashion, do you do any recommendations for retail therapy? <laughs> do you mean like having people change their wardrobes around, or I, I change your wardrobe around? Just just break out the cash or card or whatever it is, and just go spend on you. Go spend a little something on you. Go do a little. As the, as the saying goes, a little retail therapy. Yes. Um, but not on Amazon, like real retail therapy. Yes. Like you got to go in the store. Yes, I understand. <laughs> um, I'm just okay. saying, like, people think that, like, oh, I go on Amazon and I'll buy things and I feel better. No, until you understand real retail therapy, like going they, into a store. Like a glass of champagne or a beautiful bottle of water and they take you around the store. It's quite a beautiful experience. Yeah. Don't listen to Nathan. I'm Nathan. <laughs> Nathan, the, the only thing you approach is last during fantasy football. So uh, that's funny. But, um, okay, so if my if this client is listening, I'm sorry for sharing the story publicly. But I, I hope you are client, listening. I have had I don't know your name. Where um well I have had to tell them you need to change your wardrobe. Um I had mm. one client that liked to wear crocs to work. And I was like, you need to never wear those shoes again. And we must burn them <laughs> and never wear them to the office. Um, so every once in a while, what will happen with a client is that when we're looking at developing someone's executive presence, we do actually have to deal with like how they're presenting themselves. And that is a, a way that our coaching can go if we're working on helping somebody either get promoted or build a brand or raise money. It, it, like presentation does matter. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of having having a presentation that really suits you and not actually fitting in in like the traditional way. I talk a lot about the benefits of being an outlier and how to leverage what makes you unique um, and to not shy away from your personal style at work and not and not necessarily feel like it's a fit the mold. Um, you're more memorable and people will uh, resonate with you and because you're more authentic and they, that will come off that way. Um, <laughs> Cody says burning Crocs releases more toxins into the air. Just let's not make them anymore. <laughs> Cody, if you ever get a chance, look up how Crocs became famous. The movie. Have you, do you know what I'm talking yes. about? Do you know this movie? Yes. What was it? Idiocracy. It, 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 idiocracy. It was from the movie Idiocracy, and the mm -hmm. the wardrobe lady was like, "Yeah, these are stupid. No one will ever wear these." And from that movie, they became famous. Exactly. Uh, they did. But now, so so I want to stay with this image piece for a second as as a coach. And I wanted to kind of talk about this for a second. When when you're coaching someone on image and you said that outlier, I love that because I, when I worked a corporate piece, I'm OK with the Jamie Dimon look. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to look that part of being when I was a director, I want to look that part that you understand where I'm at. Mm -hmm. I'm not a grease monkey anymore. I've done that job. Mm -hmm. I've now moved to this level. But do you think that sometimes people 
they want to be that what is that right term it's something like it's like broke chic or something like that where like i think about the uh what are the twins that were on uh the twin sisters that were on uh full house that, that oh they, ashley yeah yeah right that's our names yes the, have you ever seen them like now they're like super gaunt and everything they wear makes them look homeless, but you got millions of dollars. Yes. Yes. It's a whole aesthetic. Yeah. Like what is your feeling in that professional? And, and maybe there is an environment for everything. Olsen twins. Thank you, Cody. There's a, there's an environment for all these things. And Grace, I'll get to your question in one second. There's an environment for all these things, but where should that, that line be? Or is there a line? for yeah. people in that professional attire. Yes. Okay. This is one of my favorite topics because it also comes, it, it talks about the intersectionality of like, what is professionalism and how does that tie into this concept of creating a sense of belonging in the workplace? So there's a lot, and there's a lot of heat around this in recent time. Um, things like the crown law, which is effectively um, a law that's been passed that says that people can wear their hair any way that they want at work um, that needed to be a law because people were discriminated against if they were having braids or traditional hairstyles or even wearing traditional hairdresses that was considered unacceptable. So there's a lot of things that play into this topic about what's professional and or acceptable that do have a slant that is somewhat um, in the DEI space. So, and I think that's important for companies to, to consider and think about, you know, what does their handbook look like? And what are what are we deeming as professional and non-professional? Like showing tattoos or wearing piercings, or you know, it runs the gamut. Um, so for me, this is a, a hot button. But to keep it in the top from the space of like the individual, so let's not talk about companies, but like about how I'm showing up at work. I think it's important to understand the context, like where are you working, um, and the situation, like what is acceptable for where you're working and who you are, like what is your level in this organization? And then from that place, deciding what is most authentic for you. Um, some people might have that might reflect on this for themselves and say, what's most authentic for me is, you know, wearing my nose ring and having my tattoos show. Okay, that might be really authentic for you. And you might be a managing director at JP Morgan. It could be possible, right? Um, other people might say, I know I really want to kind of be beige in this scenario. Like I just want to blend into the background. And, you know, I want no one to notice me. I want to be just known for my merits and my look shouldn't impact anything. So it's really an individual preference. Either way, my take on it is making sure that that has integrity for you and you're showing up how you want to show up, um, regardless of what's acceptable or not acceptable. Does that answer? And it's clean and it doesn't smell funky. <laughs> and it's presentable. I had a guy show up in my office that every time he showed up, he looked like he had just left a wedding the night prior and couldn't find his suit jacket. Uh, the bottom of the shirt was all the white t the white dress shirt was always wrinkled at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Was always in a pair of slacks and the shoes were never polished. Like, bro, we weren't at a you you weren't at a, a wedding last night. Like <laughs> This is pull it together. Yes. Well, I think, well, here's the thing about that, right? I think that look, somebody can look, you can be in an aesthetic and look a certain, like, and have like the homeless aesthetic, let's just call it that, right? Or like this, right. like, very kind of like my tattered shirt, tattered jeans, which I think is very cool, by the way. I, I, right. don't know, I think it's pretty great and still be neat and put together, right? And, I was and, a gunnery sergeant in the Marine Corps. That's what he's saying. Ah, uh, gotcha. Um, and and still be put together. So I think the, the point that you're making is putting effort and care into Thank how you're you. showing up. And that and when you put effort and care in something, even if it's an aesthetic that maybe is not what we deem professional, people will still feel like there's effort and care, and it's not it's not deliberate. It presents or it delivers. It's different, right? So I think that's the, the larger piece of it. It's like when you're show, when you are trying to be great at your job or get promoted or do anything in which you want to be seen as a credible, um, high value person, you have to put effort. The way that you are behaving 
does more than like the physical action of what you're doing, right? Your energy is inclusive. So if you're kind of like not caring, a little sloppy and a little lazy, that's going to come off no matter what you do. And that's what people are going to respond to, not your clothing. And that's why you need a coach also. And you yes. need to find Krissa. And again, folks, if you're just joining us, her website is www.krissa.com. Voice, B O Y C E dot com. And you're going to check her out. And then you're going to follow her on LinkedIn to see all the amazing things she puts up. And then you're going to follow her on Instagram. And you're going to see all the amazing things that she puts up there. And then if you have questions, you're going to ask them right now. And Grace has got a question for us because it's almost time to close the bar. So we'll just get to Grace's question. And Grace, thank you for following our YouTube today. And I appreciate you popping up. Uh, it says, What steps can I take and validate? my interest and skills in a new career path before making a full commitment? Oh, okay. Great question. Um, so I recommend that you talk to people in the industry that you want to be in uh, or the career that you want to be doing. Um, a lot of times um, getting becoming really intimate with what is happening in that space will help you assess whether or not it feels like a good place for you to be. Um, Sometimes at, a, at face value, things can seem really interesting. And then when you dig in a little deeper, it doesn't really resonate. Wasn't what you thought it was. What wasn't what you thought it was. Yeah. I always like to tell my clients, there is the job description and then there's your real job. So go find out like the real job because the job description is not the real job. That is it, at best directionally accurate. At best. So <laughs> I like that. Out. That's the best I've ever heard. It's directionally accurate. That is the best description of job descriptions I've ever heard. Yeah, because, you know, they're, they're not really what you're going to be doing all day long, you know. Um, so that's the first thing I would say is go find people in that space, really get get to know what they do um, and see how that feels for you. The other thing is that I like to give my clients this assignment called the career threat assignment, which is basically looking at your all the various things that you've done in your life. Um, like, so like, like just a list of like all the positions and then thinking through three main things as it pertains to them. Like what was the actual skill set that you, the main skills you used? How did you add value and what brought you joy? And I if you go that. through each job, what you'll see is a common thread. And it's more important to lean into that thread than it is to go find a job where like you can do all these skills, where you can, all your skills can match. I love that because I, I get it completely. I, I, I do something similar with what I do where, you know, Hey, you, you can find the commonality and once you're there, that's really what somebody's looking for. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. that's, and, I love that. And that can, that's industry agnostic as even, you know, role agnostic it just really kind of depends on where you are able to like add the imp create the impact that you want to create and use the skills that are natural to you that i love that now you kind of you've used some terms here and i wanted to throw one out that kind of came to mind with grace's question as far as you know validating interests and skills and everything what is your feeling as a coach now, I believe in this, and I believe this is something that you can do, but I think it's more than just magic the way people try to say it. But what is your feelings as a coach when dealing with people that are like, I'm trying to manifest my new career path and I can't find it? Like this overindulgence in manifestation, but but what I call it is manifestation without effort, mm -hmm. it, it, where people are like, well, I spoke it out into the ether. It should happen. Like, mm -hmm. no, you actually have to put effort into it and then it shows up. What has been your experience or how do you address that? Yeah. Um, so my experience has like run the gamut. Some people really do believe in the power of manifestation. They they lean on that a lot and it works for them. Um, and then other people don't lean on that enough. So for me with my clients, mm -hmm. it's trying to figure out where they fall and like moving them sort of towards like the middle or from some balanced approach. Um, I like to look at this from three different perspectives, though, like triad. Um, the first piece is like, what what is it that you want to manifest? I teach my clients a specific strategy for manifesting what they want. Um, it's not enough to just put it out into the ether. You actually need to like feel it, right? There has to be like a, I'm excited about something and you have to be connected to that goal. You also need to be able to tell people about it. If you're not telling people about it and like putting energy out there, no one's going to know that you want this. And the more that you talk about it and speak life to it, 
We can look at that from an energetic standpoint. You're creating a great energy field around you, but the thing that you want, but you're also telling it, you're socializing the idea. So that means that people know what you want. It's, it's creating energy. You never know who's going to hear it, who's going to remember you needed help, and it's going to come back to you. And then you have to collect evidence about the thing that you want to happen. And evidence doesn't have to be big evidence. If you got some callback from a recruiter, it can be something tiny, like a validation of a, of a specific skill, or it could be someone commenting on, you know, a way that you add value to them once upon a time. So you're attuning yourself to the signs and guiding yourself in the direction that you need to go to to get the result that you want. So from my perspective, that's how you manifest. You don't just sit there and kind of say, this is my vision board and let's see what happens, right? It's active, but it's holding space for the thing. The other side of the Lovely. equation is that um, I really do believe in you got to go out there and make things happen. So part of it's creating a strategy to like cause opportunities to come to you to have the thing you want happen. So that's a whole other discussion around making it happen. It's not the manifest manifesting discussion. It's more the how are you going to be in physical reality trying to change your circumstances. Um, and then the last piece is actually just like believing in what's meant for you will come for you. And I think a lot of times what we want to do is force something um, that is not for us because we like the idea of it or we want it so badly. And I really believe it in, like, sounds what? really awesome. And I would like to have this. Yes. <laughs> that but, mindset. Yeah. But what's not meant for you, like won't be good for you and you won't like it anyways. And sometimes what's meant for you, you wouldn't even imagine. Like I, I joke because now in my life I do operations consulting and, um, process systems, HR work, which is like a world that if you talk to me 15 years ago, I would laugh at you because I hated that stuff. I liked marketing and branding. That's where I was the best. And I was awful at operation work and no one would think I would ever be doing this. I promise you. But someone saw something in me and they nudged me to get into the space. And the truth is when we talked about that career thread, like what I'm good at is being able to see the bigger picture, understand what has to happen mobilize people to get it done. And I know how to, and I know how to make things beautiful. Like I know how to pull things together in a beautiful way. So it all works well. I can do that in branding and marketing with the client or in operations, right? So it doesn't really matter with a space, but if someone didn't show this to me and like nudge me in this way, I never would have been doing what I do right now. So there's also the, the piece of like being open for whatever comes your way and taking the opportunities as they come to see where they lead. That. I love that. That is probably one of the best answers I've heard in a long time because I, I just love the fact that you're like, yeah, you can manifest, but hey, you got to speak it out to actually so people hear you and then they yeah. start. Because I think most people want to say that, hey, I was part of this person becoming successful. Mm -hmm. I, I I was part of that that person's uh, success. And you're getting, we got a few people popping up uh over here on our live on Instagram. Uh, Zephyr says Raven. I think he meant to say Raven stink, but he said Raven sink S Y N C, but that's all right. Cause I got my big Baltimore Ravens thing here uh -huh. and uh, Alamani what's going on there. If you guys have any questions, please let us know. We're getting ready to close up the bar here. We got just a few more minutes now. Nate must've popped off. So I'm going to ask this question for Nate. Cause normally this would be a Nate question. This is very important to him. Do you have, and I'm going to kind of manipulate the question he always asks. Do you have a coaching meal that you go to? This is like something that you like to sit down uh, and, and talk to people and say like, hey, let's, let's start our coaching session over a meal. Or do you finish them over meals or anything like that? Like actual food, like start like real food, like real, like real food substance that goes in your belly and goes yum, yum, yum. It's really hard to talk and eat at the same time. So I'm going to say no food that I would oh, do, really? but I'm a big fan of coffee. So okay, over coffee, I really do like a good latte and I'm not going to lie about that. That does make me happy. Or I'm a tequila fan. So when it, when it is appropriate oh. to have a drink or bring a drink into the equation towards the end of a coaching session with the client, if you happen to be in person, mm -hmm. I, I would lean towards it, tequila. Do I even have, what do I got under here? 
So, you know, I'm, I'm at my bar right now. Yes. Uh, I got, I got, uh, I got Jose Cuervo gold. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I mean, I'm not a big tequila person. I, I, I should have a bottle of mezcal. Just you know. oh, very good. Are you a whiskey fan? I feel, I feel like scotch whiskey. L listen, so <laughs> big whiskey. I, and I'm actually even bigger rye. I love oh. rye whiskeys. Okay. Oh, all right. Whistle pig, 10 year. That's what I've been, I was just sipping on. And if you ever make your way uh, to the cap, to the capital region, you can actually, these guys are local. This is in the Helderbergs up here in Albany, oh. Scotland spirits. And uh, I should probably introduce you to Jesse so you can coach him. He was in the army. He needs all the help he can get, you know, as a Marine, I try to do my best for those guys. But uh, yeah, I'm a big uh, rye whiskey, uh, bourbon, and I don't know if you knew this or not, but rye is a New York grain. We I did actually, not know this. And we actually have a line of rye whiskey now known as Empire Rye, like you have Kentucky bourbons. Oh, interesting. New York State passed an entire thing for it. Nice. Uh, Zephyr says he loves tequila. It makes it makes him hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Ah, yes. <laughs> the, yes. Tequila Brain is one of those weird ones. Like I just learned this recently. Like if you got you if you pay attention to the tequilas you're drinking, as long as they're not heavy sugars and starch like BS tequilas that mm -hmm. that have used a lot of extra stuff in them, tequila you won't get a hangover with. You will not get a hangover at all. This is true. Because but it's got to be real. Like yeah, legit agave yeah. tequila. Yeah. It can't be like heavy sugars, like tequila-esque, which I yeah. thought was interesting. That's right. That's right. No hangover. Feels good. Not a lot of calories. That's what it's all about. Drink. Not a lot of calories. It's a drink. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I like scotch, by the way. I'm a scotch okay. fan. Okay. Interesting. Zephyr, I call everybody dude. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's definitely... So, okay. So if we're, it's interesting though, to go for, for, for a drink afterwards. I see, I've, you know, Zig Ziglar is. Mm -hmm. So Zig was always big about, you know, never drink with clients and never use any, ever use profanity with clients. Mm -hmm. Those were like big things. And I always keep those in my head because in my line of work, I've had clients were like, Hey, you want a beer as we're talking about this? And I'm like, I appreciate it. I'll take a cup of coffee. Or, or a bottle of water. Gotcha. I'm very like, I'm very anti, but, but I use that zig mindset. You know, yeah. he also thought that rock and roll was for the devil. So. Got it. Well, I broke his I, rules. I, I use profanity. I, and sometimes I'll drink. <laughs> I, I use profanity. All coach, the you have to, I think as a <laughs> yeah. coach, you have to though. Like I really right. expect my coach at some point in time to be like, listen, asshole. <laughs> yes. Like, like Otherwise, I, we're not doing I, our job. We have to call you out. That's it, our job. It's a definitely a necessary evil. So mm -hmm. let's get into this. We're we're getting ready to close the bar. Krista, how can people get a hold of you? We've been talking about the website, ChrisaZBoyce.com. What else can people do? What if they want to find you for a coaching session? What do they need to do? Oh, that's great. So if you want to find me for coaching, you can go to my website or you can email me directly. It's Krista at ChrisaZBoyce.com. So I'm easy to find. Or you can go to LinkedIn. Um, and I do executive coaching and that is a space that I hang out in, but I do other types of coaching as well. Um, so I don't want anyone to feel like if they resonate with what I said, that they, they if they're not an executive, they can't come find me. I, my approach is more holistic, as I mentioned. So please reach out either way. And I also do fractional work as well. Um, both culture building work and also fractional COO work for organizations. So if you're a business owner and you're like, I have to scale my operations. I can't really figure out what's going on here. Things aren't working how they are, how I want them to be working. I, I also work in that space. So I'm happy to talk about that as well. That's a, Listen, folks, if you haven't got a chance to check out Chris, make sure you're going and checking her out. If you're finding me through Chris or Chris through me, I have to tell you, please take a moment, like, share, subscribe, check out what she's got going on. Check out what we've got going on. When you give us a thumbs up, everybody that popped in today and gave us all the thumbs up and hearts and likes, you have no idea what that value is to somebody like me in social media. Krista, who's done marketing, she will tell you the same thing. There is a huge monstrous value to us because that's how the algorithms work. That's what the algorithms see. If there was a thousand likes and hearts right now, Trust me, this it, 
they would have pushed it to a thousand other people to see if that's what they want to watch. So take the time, do those things. Let us know what you got going on. Now, oh, excuse me for a second. Now, next week, I'm going to jack this name. Chris, I am horrible with names. Your name, I loved because it was super easy for me, and I super appreciate it. Mm. And I don't know if Cody or, or Ken's still around, but they will both tell you I murderize names. I'm not good with them. Uh, it is horrible. So we're gonna we're gonna work on this. So we have James Nor Norkowich, N O R K A W I C H. Nor Nor Norwich Nor Norkowich. Okay. See, I told you, I just butcher names. But he's in Glastonbury, Connecticut, and he's bringing 30 years of rich musical experience to a role as a jazz present, pianist, composer, arranger, producer, and he's the owner of Studio, Studio 55 uh, down in that way. And we're going to be talking jazz mu music and how he blends it together, which I'm a big music fan. I love music. I love going to concerts. We're going to see... My next big concert is Marcus King, July 13th, up here in Albany. So Nice, nice. Well, I'm going to tune into the episode that you just mentioned because I love jazz and I'm from Connecticut. I didn't even know there was this, this studio thing happening there. See that? Mm -hmm. So now I know you, you, you binged all. This is like episode 230-something, I think is what this, or 228 or something like that. Uh, let's see, real quick. Zephyr says she's doing water shots, and her last name is, oh, uh, yeah, you ain't going to get me on this one, Zephyr. Sada, Satash, yeah, see, it looks like your last name is Sat That Shite, but it's S-A-T-A-T-H-I-T-E. Who's that? Help, help me out, Chris. S-A-T-A, Sata, Thighty, T-H-I-T-E. I I would say so. Sata Thai. Sata Okay, she helps me out here. Sata the tight. P H I T E. The tight. Thight. Sata tight. Not the tight. Look, I haven't even had that much bourbon tonight, and I'm already <laughs> like. Thai, thai, thai. I'm, well, I'm okay. sorry. Zephyr, I'll butcher your name up. I ain't trying to, my dear. But so. I know you binged all the other 200 and some episodes. Chrissy, you're fully immersed in everything about this show. So you know what's coming up next, don't you? I'll, I'll tell it to you anyway, just in case you forget. I'm nervous. The guest always gets the final word. And don't log off on me afterwards. we got to talk for just a hot minute afterwards. So what's the final word? Ooh, the final word. Um... Damn, I'm usually good at the final word. Now I'm just like running out of things to say. My final word is learn that your reputation is how you make people feel. Alrighty, folks, be sure to push your stool in. This has been a Second Front Podcast presentation found on Apple, Spotify, and wherever podcasts can be found. 